What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation, where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission? At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders, from ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities. CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov careers. Hi, this is Scott. If you're a fan of the ancient world, please help us get the word out. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and rate the series on iTunes. Thanks again for listening. The Ancient World Bloodline Episode B30, Mater Castrorum The Samian ships made for the narrow headland, jutting from the north shore of the Propontis. Landing on the beach a hundred strong, the men climbed the rugged hillside to take in their new home. The cape had the welcoming curve of a Greek amphitheater, and the sea lanes that crossed it promised rich trade. But first, the fire, brought with care from their home city, was used to light a local altar— making the firm connection to Samos and her divine protector, Hera. It wasn't unusual to name the colony after the group's leader. The aristocrat who'd lay out the city, divide the land, and establish its form of government. If this was the case, both leader and colony were called Perinthos. At the time of its foundation, in 602 BC, the Neo-Assyrian Empire had just been destroyed, and its territories carved up by the Medes and Babylonians. The most powerful local ruler was Aliates, the king of Lydia, both antagonist and protector of Ionian Greeks. The colony's early years saw more of the latter, as Aliates defended the region against repeated Median attacks. But the decades that followed saw the young Persian Empire conquer Media, then Lydia, then the whole of Anatolia. Before long, back in Samos, the tyrant Polycrates took power, and began his dangerous intrigues with the Egyptians and the Persians. But Perinthos was far from Samos, separated from the Persians by the broad Propontis, and free of any local control by the fractious tribes of Thrace. Its independence and location allowed the colony to prosper, as a critical safe harbor between the Black and Aegean seas. In 513 BC, the Persian king Darius crossed the Hellespont on a bridge of boats and claimed all of Thrace for his empire. For Perinthos, the dark days lasted until the Greek victory at Plataea, when Darius' son Xerxes was driven back to Asia. In his wake, Perinthos joined the Delian League, an alliance led by Athens to carry the war to Persia. But after Athens lost to Sparta in the Peloponnesian War, the alliance was dismantled, and Perinthos came under control of Adrysian Thrace. While both the city and kingdom resisted Macedonian conquest, both eventually succumbed to slow Roman encroachment. In 46 AD, the emperor Claudius converted Adrysian Thrace into the Roman province of Thracia bringing Greek Perinthos under the rule of Rome. But even then, it took another century and a half for Perinthos to become ground zero in a Roman civil war. Arriving with her husband, her children, and the bulk of Severus's army, Julia Domna would have seen the clear marks of recent conflict. Pisenius Niger had come west as far as Perinthos, dealing a bloody defeat to Severus's general, Fabius Silo. But then, disheartened by ill omens, Niger had withdrawn to his headquarters of Byzantium. For Severus, the military loss was minor compared to the propaganda win. Up until now, he hadn't really declared his intentions in marching east. 
And he'd also done his best to suppress any news about Niger declaring himself emperor. But now that Niger had struck first, Severus could claim that his rival was a rebel and renegade who'd attacked his fellow Romans. With the proof in hand, Severus called on the Senate to declare Niger and Aemilianus to be enemies of Rome. Settling into his new military headquarters at Perinthos, only 50 miles from Byzantium, Severus began directing his massive war machine to dismember his opponents. A legate named Marius Maximus was given responsibility for capturing Niger's stronghold of Byzantium. Another legate named Tiberius Claudius Candidus was to carry the war to the province of Asia and destroy Niger's lieutenant, Aemilianus. The magnitude of Severus's threat was clearly unnerving Niger, and he sent a letter offering to divide the empire. Severus counteroffered to let Niger live if he surrendered and submitted to exile. Meanwhile, every report coming Severus's way gave him further confidence of victory. In Asia, Candidus captured and beheaded Aemilianus, then drove his army east into Bithynia. At the same time, Niger decided to flee Byzantium and rendezvous with the remnants of Aemilianus's forces at Nicaea. Basing himself in nearby Nicomedia, Candidus kept on the attack and soon forced Niger to flee further east. Severus wasted no time trumpeting his victory back to Rome, and by February of 194, he learned that Egypt had abandoned Niger. Though the war was far from over, the momentum was clearly on Severus's side. Byzantium was under siege, Niger fled to Antioch, and Severus was now master of western Anatolia. It's at this point that we come to one of the most interesting and revealing episodes in Severus's career. About 50 miles southeast of Byzantium, on the south shore of the Propontis, lay the minor Anatolian village of Libyssa. Its only significance was as the final resting place of Hannibal, beloved of Baal and Punic, the great Carthaginian general and one-time terror of the Republic. In 182 BC, Hannibal was in the service of the Bithynian king Prusius when he learned he was being handed over to the Romans. Before it could happen, he drank poison and quickly died. He left behind a letter that read, Let us relieve the Romans from the anxiety they've so long experienced, since they think it tries their patience too much to wait for an old man's death. Once Bithynia was secure, Severus made an excursion, possibly with Julia, the children, and the most trusted of his bodyguard, to visit Hannibal's tomb. Not only that, but as reported by the 12th century Byzantine historian John Setzes, the Roman emperor Severus, being of Libyan birth, placed in a tomb of white marble this man, the general Hannibal. Perhaps even a harem, like that erected for the murdered Pertinax, or like those built in ancient times on the plains of Troy to the west. It's hard to overstate the significance of the act. Rome wasn't in the habit of glorifying defeated enemies. Hannibal wasn't admired by the Romans for his courage or his tenacity or his brilliant generalship. To the contrary, even four centuries later, he was reviled, feared, and despised. In fact, Hannibal was arguably the most hated man in the entire history of Rome. So what does it say about Septimius Severus, a man still in the process of winning the empire, that he went out of his way to honor such a figure? Well, it seems to say several things. First, it shows that Severus was fiercely proud of his African heritage and his Punic roots. Growing up in Lepsis Magna, a city founded by Carthage, clearly gave Severus a more nuanced take on Hannibal's legacy. Second, we're talking about someone 100% confident in both himself and his chances for success. 
Whether it was Julia's horoscope, his own dreams, or just an insightful understanding of the forces at play, it's unlikely Severus would have paid Hannibal homage if he thought it might cost him victory. But above all, to me, it says one thing crystal clear. Severus did not give a damn about Roman sensitivities, and he had no illusions about the nature of his rule. In fact, Severus literally marched around with a war chest, under control of his quartermaster Vitulus, which he used to disperse the payments needed to keep his troops in line. In short, Severus knew that as long as he continued to enrich the soldiers, he needn't think twice about scorning other men. In the same spirit, Severus minted coins featuring the traditional deities of Lepsis Magna, Father Liber, the god of wine, and the legendary demigod Hercules. In coordination, Severus's designated Caesar, Clodius Albinus, minted coins featuring Baal Hammon, the ancient ram-horned Carthaginian god of his own home city of Hadrumetum. At about this time, Severus was also joined by another longtime colleague. Publius Cornelius Anulinus was an equestrian from southern Hispania who'd known Severus for decades. He was also, technically, still proconsul of Africa, but had been summoned to Perinthos to take command of the war against Niger. Even as Anulinus headed east, Severus got word that another of Niger's allies had deserted him. The governor of Arabia Petraea, who happened to be a native of Perinthos, was so upset by Niger's assault on his hometown that he decided to switch sides. Also, in Syria, the major cities of Laodicea and Tyre had openly declared for Severus. The climatic battle of the Civil War took place near the town of Issus, the same place Alexander defeated the Persians 500 years earlier. Cassius Dio gives a detailed account, but, long story short, Anulinus and a cavalry commander named Valerius Valerianus eventually won the day, and a short time afterward captured Antioch. Niger made a break for the Euphrates, but was caught and killed and his head sent to Severus as a trophy. The Second Battle of Issus ended the Roman Civil War and secured the empire for Septimius Severus. Several weeks later, in May 194, Severus finally made his way east to Syria. For Julia Domna, who'd never seen Anatolia before, the journey must have been eye-opening. Aside from the region's natural beauty, every city they passed through huge victory celebrations, funded by local nobles hoping to make a good impression. Once he'd arrived in Syria, Severus stripped all the governors and legates who'd supported Niger of both their posts and their property. But he also realized, in the wake of Niger and Avidius Cassius, that Syria was just too powerful to remain a province. His solution was identical to that of the ancient Assyrian king Tiglath Pileser III. If a territory is too strong, just cut it in half. Of course, being Severus, he added his own unique spin. And, as part of the process, Severus brought Phoenicia back to life. The new Roman provinces of Syria Phoenice and Coel Syria suggest a division between the Syrian coast and interior. But actually, Syria was divided north and south with the border running from just south of Dura Europos on the Euphrates to just north of Palmyra, Emesa, and the seaport of Eridus. The ancient city of Tyre was made capital of Syria Phoenice, while Julia's home of Emesa was instantly transformed from pilgrimage site to major provincial city. In the new province of Coel Syria to the north, the capital was moved from traitorous Antioch to faithful Laodicea. Both Tyre and Laodicea were exempted from Roman taxation, while Antioch lost its status of metropolis. On a smaller scale, Julia may have influenced Severus in his treatment of some Syrians, 
friends or enemies of herself or her family. But either way, once back in the area, she certainly took the opportunity to visit Emissa. It had to be an amazing scene. A city that rarely saw high-ranking Romans now welcomed a Roman empress, with her full entourage and military escort. Remarkable on its own, but yeah, that empress also happened to be both a local girl and daughter of their esteemed high priest, Julius Bassianus. Emissa hadn't seen anything like it since the days of King Sohamus and Queen Drusilla, Julia's great-great-great-grandparents. Back in those days, their king had led his Hemisani archers off in service of the empire and returned in victory through these same city gates. To see his descendant return home as Roman Empress must have been absolutely mind-blowing. The reunion between the 24-year-old Julia Domna, her 59-year-old father, her two young sons, now six and five, and the rest of her extended family was definitely cause for celebration. And, unlike Severus, who'd once arrested a hometown friend for acting too familiar, Julia was probably a bit more secure. She even got the chance to meet her newest cousin, Julius Uranius, who was only a bit younger than Geta. Whether expressed aloud or in private thoughts, both Julia and her father must have recognized their good fortune. Julia's horoscope could have led her to marry a Niger or a Pertinax or a Didius Julianus. Wife of a king, yes, but one whose rule was measured in days. Instead, the fates had been extremely kind to match her with a man like Severus. Julia would have also been happy to learn that Severus was staying in the region. As it happened, the emperor had three main items on his short-term to-do list. First off, any of Niger's troops who'd fled into Parthia needed to be tracked down and killed. Second, Osrowini, Adiabene, and local Arab tribes needed to be punished for offering Niger support. And third, Roman control needed to be re-established over the critical city of Nisibis. These were good enough reasons to consider an eastern campaign, but Severus also had others. So far, he'd only won victories over his fellow Romans. In fact, Byzantium was still under siege. Much better to win a decisive victory over a weak foreign opponent, then return back to Rome in triumph. Severus also experienced a bit of a homecoming when he arrived at his staging ground of Zugma. The prosperous city was the legionary base of his old command, the 4th Scythian Legion. Just across the Euphrates lay the Roman client kingdom of Osroene, ruled by Abgar IX from his capital of Edessa. Beyond that, approaching the Tigris, was the Roman toehold of Nisibis, retained by Lucius Verus after his victory three decades earlier. And just across the Tigris lay what remained of the Parthian client kingdom of Adiabene. As mentioned previously, Adiabene was made up of ethnic Assyrians who'd converted to Judaism. So, I'm going to say fairly militant. Since losing their capital of Nisibis to the Romans, their current king Narses ruled from Arbella, modern Erbil. The growth of Christianity in both Osrowini and Adiabene had brought the two kingdoms into closer alignment. And when Niger staked his claim to the Roman Empire, both Abgar and Narses had offered their support. But once Niger started losing, they turned on a dime and launched a joint attack on Nisibis. They apparently succeeded capturing the city, killing the Roman garrison, and taking their fill of both hostages and plunder. Then came the news that Niger was dead, and Severus was coming east to reclaim the city. The two kings responded by sending an embassy to let Severus know that they actually had his back. You see, the only reason they'd attacked Nisibis was that its Roman garrison had been loyal to Niger. 
So, you're welcome? In the spring of 195, Severus led his army into Osrowini. King Abgar sent captives, gifts, and professions of loyalty, and in turn was allowed to retain his kingdom. But, though Narses made similar gestures, there was just too much history to let Adiabene slide. As a first step, Severus retook Nisibis and made the city his military headquarters. He then dispatched his senior generals to make war on the Adiabenes and local Arab tribes. By mid-year, Severus had been successful enough to declare himself both Parthicus Arabicus and Parthicus Adiabenicus. Severus chose the titles with surgical precision. They indicated the conquered peoples were vassals of the Parthian Empire, which they were. But he notably did not claim the title of Parthicus or Parthicus Maximus, which would have implied, or even instigated, open warfare with the Parthians. In April 195, likely while still in Emesa, Julia learned she'd been granted her own honorific. By the will of the Senate and people of Rome, she'd been hailed as Mater Castrorum, Mother of the Camp. According to historian Barbara Levick, the meaning of the title was obvious. The troops were under the protection of the empress, and she could expect their protection in return. Statues of Julia Domna would now inhabit the shrines of legionary units, a constant reminder of just who they served. It was a perfect expression of the mutual dependence between the Severan regime and the Roman military. The only other empress to receive the title was Faustina, the wife of Marcus Aurelius. And Faustina had been born of imperial blood, the daughter of the previous emperor Antoninus Pius, which meant that in the course of two years, Julia had gone from governor's wife to one of the most honored women in Roman history. Which is all very nice, but if you don't mind, Severus would like to ramp up the audacity to eleven. On a new set of coins, Severus declared that he was, wait for it, the son of Marcus Aurelius, which probably came as quite a surprise to his longtime friends and colleagues from Africa, not to mention his older brother, his sister, and the rest of his extended family. But of course, when you assert something like that, you don't really need proof. You just need to feel comfortable that no one has the guts to call you on it in public. Which, yeah, safe bet. In imitation of his quote-unquote father, Marcus, Severus decided to elevate their eldest son, seven-year-old Caracalla, to the rank of Caesar. The boy's name was even changed from Lucius Septimius Bassianus to Marcus Aurelius Antoninus Caesar, obviously trading sentiment for propaganda value. Like most stones thrown by Severus, these were designed to kill an entire flock of birds. On the one hand, the claim tied Septimius Severus to the Antonine dynasty, who'd already ruled Rome for nearly a century. On the other hand, the new emperor, his mater castrorum, and his Caesar were meant to evoke fond memories of the reign of Marcus Aurelius. On the third hand, if you're a Hindu god, I guess, saying you're Marcus's son could also be taken as a threat. As in, I can be Marcus Aurelius if you let me, but I can also be Commodus if you force me. And on the fourth hand, Elevating Caracalla to the rank of Caesar was intended to lance a very particular boil. As you may recall, Severus had already given the role of Caesar to his Britannic rival Clodius Albinus. In fact, in Severus's absence, the Roman Senate had been encouraging the more republican Albinus to come to Rome and overthrow the Severan military regime. Though he'd so far refused, Severus knew that conflict was coming, and, like with Niger, it was sometimes useful to make one's rival appear the aggressor. 
Elevating Caracalla to Caesar was meant to provoke Albinus into making the first move. And in that regard, it went off perfectly. Hearing of the obvious snub, Albinus renounced his alliance, proclaimed himself emperor, and sent troops south into Gaul. Unsurprisingly, Severus had already sent an army west, under the trusted general Candidus, to confront him. The man already responsible for the deaths of two emperors was now wagering his future on a third and final throw. <laughs> 